Big data and artificial intelligence. These are some of the key issues that are currently debated in the antitrust circle. And I think as we can see from this morning and um, from the panels that have, and the questions raised during those panels, uh, these are hotly debated topics and much written about, both um, from the legal circle and academic circle, and as well as from ec uh, economists. And so it's fair to say there are a lot of different views on these two topics, and the subject is divergent. And so in this panel, I'm hoping we can actually have a conversation about these two topics, and we can actually start with going back to the basics and trying to understand what is the concerns and why we're concerned and how to approach these analytically. But before we get there, maybe we can start with a um, general question, which is, since Patricia, you're here, and the technology task force is a new task force, perhaps we can hear from you about what the task force is up to, what its priorities are, all right, thank you, Ruth. Uh, let me say, start by saying thank you to the conference organizers for inviting me here. Uh, these are obviously important topics to discuss. Frankly, debate and discussion are critical to our enforcement efforts, to learning from our mistakes, and moving forward in light of this new technology and making the right enforcement decisions. Before I go too much further, I need to give my standard disclaimer, which is I am here speaking for myself and not for the Federal Trade Commission or any individual commissioner, which is important to them that I say that. <laughs> so uh, to talk a little bit about the Technology Task Force, this was announced at the end of February and it has um, just recently launched. So we are very early in our work. Please do not expect too much from me today. Uh, the, this is a permanent group of attorneys that are dedicated to evaluating competition issues in the areas where technology is a particularly important dimension of competition. We are beginning our investigations and we are also engaged in an extensive general fact-finding effort to understand how these markets work, what the competitive dynamics are, and whether or not there are any particular concerns about practices that we should focus our attention on. The task force is currently made up of 15 attorneys, but we are still recruiting. In particular, we are um, bringing on another attorney with an intellectual property background, recognizing the interests um, we have in understanding some of the IP issues, as well as a technology fellow. This is not an attorney, but someone who could bring into our group on a permanent basis the technical expertise they have with respect to many of the different types of products that we're talking about. And from our perspective, we're looking for someone who can help us translate what we hear from companies, not just about the concerns that we're identifying, but also their justifications from the, for the behavior in which they're engaging in. Frankly, this comes up a lot with respect to questions, for example, about whether the designs of particular products should be viewed as an attempt to harm rivals in the competitive process. So I have been asked many times, what do we mean by technology for the technology task force? So think generally speaking, we're talking about online platforms, digital advertising, social media, software, streaming services, operating systems and the like. This is for us an important space for which we thought it was necessary to bring together a group of attorneys to focus solely on potentially anti-competitive conduct in this area. The task force will primar primarily be focused on conduct, not mergers. The merger work will continue to be handled by our merger divisions. However, I just want to quickly mention that the task force will take a broad view of what we mean by conduct. So, for example, if we think that a dominant firm is engaging in acquisitions in an effort to protect uh, their position, that is certainly something that we would be willing to look at under our Section 2 law for monopolization theory. Uh, with that, I'll just finish by saying that we are interested in hearing from people like you, both to inform our efforts in this space, what we should prioritize, what we should be concerned about, what we should take note about. So, for example, we will later be talking about artificial intelligence. I feel like this is an area where there is much uh, learning to be done. 
frankly, whether or not it raises competitive problems is something that we will have to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. But nonetheless, there are general takeaways that probably will be helpful for us as attorneys to know more deeply as we begin our work. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Patricia. So maybe then we can also turn to Japan and hear from Matsushi on what is happening in the Japan space and how, I guess, the regulators are dealing with uh, technology issues in general. Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Ruth. Um, uh, I, I also like to thank the organizers for having he me here. Um, yeah, I, I think it really, uh, uh, it's truly an honor and pleasure to be part of this uh, very interesting conference. Um, so uh, with respect to Japan, um, it, actually it's a work in progress right now. Um, there's been quite amount of development in the past year or so. It's not only the JFDC, but also other ministries, uh, the uh, Industrial Policy uh, Agency, METI, also the Communications Industry uh, Ministry, MIC, are also uh, jointly working with the JFDC. And this is driven by uh, the Japanese government's uh, uh, initiative to shore up the Japanese economy. So uh, the government as a whole is working towards uh, digital economy as a whole, not necessarily limited to big data or AI. Uh, but besides that, uh, prior to this initiative, actually the JFTC uh, had uh, set up a study group to look into uh, big data and competition policy a couple of years ago. Um, so it's a couple of years ago, so it might be a little bit dated, but I think there are still some interesting uh, perspectives there. And uh, one thing that I would like to mention and also like to touch up on later is that in this report, although the study report is titled Big Data and Competition Policy, actually in this report, uh, big data has been divided into two types of data, personal data and industrial data. I, I think this uh, sheds light on the importance of looking into what type of data that you are handling and what type of context. So uh, I, I think that was a very interesting co uh, context that the report provided, and I, I would like to touch upon this later. Maybe I'll stop here. I'll focus more on the sort of the, the Korean KFTC's sort of concentration on this area. KFTC is quite interested in the technology sector. Uh, in the latter part of 2016, the KFTC established a digital investigation uh, division within the Market Surveillance Bureau uh, to monitor and in, sort of look after the ICT, bio, and high-tech industry. This was based on the cabinet resolution at the cabinet level, level in Korea. Uh, in the 2019 KFTC report to the Korean president on its enforcement plans for 2019, uh, made in the December of 2018, which is always the case every year, uh, the KFTC outlined five areas of enforcement, uh, one of which was the digital platform and high-tech industry. And I think from the Korean perspective, it does make sense to some extent because Korea does see itself as one of the most connected country in the world. Uh, it had tried to launch the you know, 5G network before everyone else by launching the service about 24 hours before this initial announcement. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it, it continues to see this industry as an important industry to monitor uh, and scrutinize. Okay, so sounds like lots of activities going on in each of the countries. Okay, maybe let's turn to big data. And then before we do that, I just wanted to mention we've broken, we're proposing to break up the two subjects so that big data, once we've discussed it, will open up the floors for questions on big data. And then once we've taken those and then discussed, then we'll move on to AI, and then we'll do the same thing for AI. All right. So... There are many who have observed and argued that the internet and the tech companies have supercharged competition by promoting connectivity, uh, information flow, and innovation, and changing the way in which consumers um, use the internet. And then there are also those, on the other hand, who caution against the rise of big data. 
and take issue with um, size and the bigness of the companies as well as the volume of the data that's been held. And so I think it's fair enough to say that uh, data can clearly be relevant in competition assessment, but it bears to thinking about the why and the how. Maybe we can start with some basics and then actually ask the question, what is big data? I'll start. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, I think there are multiple definitions of big data, right? and I think you know, some, of my, some of my colleagues here, sort of course panel members, can sort of address other things. But I think one of the definitions for big data is that it's a data that is so large in volume that it cannot be sort of analyzed or assessed with a traditional sort of software tool, right? Um, that, I, I think, is a definition that sort of became popular in the 90s. Uh, but I know that there are some other sort of ways to look at this data, big data definition. Uh, I, I think I'll add to that is, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, many or maybe all of you are aware of this, but uh, we talk about the Vs. Uh, you know, volume is one thing, but there's also a variety and velocity and the fourth one is veracity. Um, and I think uh, the OECD report on big data uh, that was issued a couple of years ago also used these as a way to define big data. However, uh, as I alluded earlier, um, it's important to have one definition at the starting point, but uh, I think it's very important to revisit that when you have something that you're examining uh, in front of you. So I will just add to that by saying Oftentimes, the concept of big data suggests that we should be doing something different from an antitrust um, enforcement perspective as opposed to data that is not called big. And I want to suggest that our approach, the way we think about it, is the same whether it's called big data or not. The idea here can be that big data raises um, different implications because of the characteristics, again, the volume, the, the veracity, et cetera. Um, but data has been around a long time, used by many companies in many contexts. And so the, the fact that something is called big data may require that we look at it more closely, but it doesn't change the analysis that we're applying, whether it's used to, um, whether it creates an entry barrier or there are other concerns with it. And so I think the idea is data as a, a um, issue if we can call it that, isn't so much unique to the digital world. Actually, fair to say that industries that are traditional or have operated in the brick and mortar uh, sector also do have or have the ability to amass data. But um, it's the processing of the data that could raise issues. Well, to, to go to your point about whether it's specific to the tech industry, obviously it's not. Companies have been, um, with respect to the development and testing and launching of new products, even say in the automobile industry, um, have been using data for a very long time. And data is used, obviously, by brick and mortar retailers, as you're suggesting. It may be that with the advent of the internet and our computational capabilities that we're able to do more with the data. And so it animates the tech industries in ways that um, could be alarming to some. So it, it's more a, a question of degree, uh, not a difference in the, the application and the use of it. And I, I think I'd I like to add one thing about that. Uh, I, I mentioned about uh, the JFTC study report uh, handling uh, industrial data separately. And the types of data that was uh, um, thought about there was things like data from human bodies or animals or uh, data that you gather through agriculture or maybe you would gather data from the production facilities. So uh, these, these are data that actually existed before, but, but the difference is that you began to think that it's useful to collect this, these data and you get the uh, ability to collect uh, and analyze and process this data. And then you have the merits of big data happening. So uh, as Ruth uh, mentioned earlier, I agree that big data itself is not so new, but what has changed is that you have the ability to look broader and process that more quicker, 
and you know, try to get the most use out of it. And I, I think this suggests that when you look at big data, it's not whether you have data is the only important issue, but the other important issue is once you have that data, how you're going to use it would be another very critical thing that we have to always keep in mind. Okay. So I think then in terms of antitrust analysis, then we have to, I think the next question would be then how, how do you define the relevant market? Um, and, and from your experience, do you see data as a product market in and of itself, data sets, or is it an input to the analysis and the product market? So I just want to start off by answering your question because there are two cases that I can refer to that the FTC has brought in the past where we have looked at both data as an input in one case and data as a relevant product in the other. So uh, in 2014, the commission issued a complaint uh, against CoreLogic for its proposed acquisition of a company called DataQuick. There were two of three firms that collected in assimilated what we call national assessor and recorder data in a bulk format. And so the assessor data is tax record data, and uh, the recorder data is data about real estate property transactions. And the idea is they, this data is maintained at local county offices. It's not always digitized. Oftentimes the paper, um, the, the data is kept um, on paper copies. And so these companies actually went to the effort of collecting, digitizing, formatting this data, and making it available um, through licenses. The idea in this case was that if these two firms merged, not only did customers need access to that data, it was difficult to replicate current data, but these two firms had the historical databases going back decades that a new entrant would not be able to replicate. I mean, there's one thing about putting together current and going forward data. It's a whole nother story entirely about trying to create a historical database. And so the commission said um, this is a raises unilateral and uh, concerns about potential coordination and block that merger. That was, that was a case where we looked at data as a relevant product. In another case, also in the same year, this was a case against um, two merging companies, Verisk and Eagleview. Um, they were both collecting aerial imagery uh, measurement data. So this is information about the size and shape of and slope of rooftops. Historically, people had to actually climb up onto the roofs to collect this um, information whenever there was damage to rooftops for insurance purposes. But these two companies were actually um, imaging this from the sky, from you know planes, and creating databases and selling it to customers for um, insurance purposes. So we, again, um, brought this case against these two companies and reached a settlement with them. And our concern was that they had the, li the only libraries of this aerial, aerial imagery. I'll just add to that a bit. I think the, I, I can see the argument and that data can both be a product in certain instances, and an input in other instances. But I think in a greater sort of context, in most instances, I think at least in the context of the tech companies, it would normally be an input rather than a product market itself. Uh, in many instances, uh, um, you know, if you look at you know various tech companies like uh, Facebook, you know, Google, or different companies, you have sort of data being sort of collected via users, right? And then there's the, the sort of the other sort of platform where they're sort of competing for the revenue from the advertisement. Um, I, I think to see the data itself as a product may be sort of difficult. Obviously, market definition is a very complicated area, and we could probably talk about it the entire day. but. I think uh, in this particular instance, I think it would be easier to view this as an input in many instances. Let's say we have defined the market. I mean, the next step then is to start assessment. And one of the key topics that often come up about big data is uh, the potential uh, barrier to entry. And by that, um, 
some have commented that data is like oil. And I've chosen that analogy because Patricia, back in Merger 3, um, looked after uh, mergers in the oil sector. And so I just want to ask the panel, um, not just Patricia, but uh, <laughs> John, for example, do you actually think that's a, that's a fair analogy? What, what do you think when people mention a phrase like that? Oh, sorry, Atsushi. <laughs> I'm looking at Atsushi and then I'm just at John. I was a bit confused. <laughs> well, uh, data is like oil, data is new oil. This is quite intuitive and I understand where it's coming from, but I don't feel it's a legal argument. You know, it gives you a sense that data is a source of money, but you know, you have to look beyond that. You know, the data has colors, and depending on context, people look differently on data. So uh, I think we shouldn't be too carried away with this uh, rather catchy couple of words uh, saying data is like oil. That, that, that's my first take. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Asushi. I, I think the if uh, I, I saw some figure and they said. Uh, the amount of big data, and I, you know, obviously big data definition can change, but amount of big data that is generated doubles every 3.5 years. So I think if we go 35 years, that's 1,000 fold, right? Um, if I, 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 data certainly is not a limited resource like oil. I, I understand that big data is important, especially in this era, but I think. Comparing that to oil might be um, a little too simplified. Uh, so the problem is that there is no one general characterization of big data. It very much depends on the industry that we're talking about and even the life cycle of that particular industry. So in the example that I gave of CoreLogic, big data was a significant not big data, but data itself was a significant entry barrier. It's extraordinarily difficult to replicate. The idea behind, you know, data is like oil is that, you know, you can't replicate it. It, is, it creates a significant entry barrier. And that's an example of a case where it did. Um, there can be times when, you know, looking at a case, say, for example, a rival is claiming that they're being foreclosed because uh, data is not being made available to them by an incumbent. Obviously, we're going to look to see whether or not there are other sources of data. And in those situations, it, it could be the case that they could go out and collect the data themselves. And that's not a particularly significant barrier to entry. And what they're looking to do is to free ride off of the incumbent's innovations or um, not just the collection, but the analysis of the data. So we, we obviously are sensitive to those kinds of um, considerations, whether or not the data is replicable or not the costs and the extent to which um, it's being used, say, to maintain a dominant position in the market. So I just want to be careful not to suggest that there is a single characterization that applies across all industries. Um, so I know, Atsushi, you, you mentioned, I think actually across all the panels we've mentioned that we have to look through into the, the, uh, the characteristics of the, the data. Maybe we can spend a little bit of time here and think about and talk about um, if Part of it is whether it's it's uh, replicable, but are there any other um, characteristics of data that you would look at? I think as a practitioner or as a regulator, in thinking it has more concerns, or there are certain characteristics of data that is less concerning. That's kind of a very tough question, but um, besides data being replicable, um, uh, again, I, I say this uh, so many times, but you, you have to look into the context where that data is used and what kind of data you have. Um, uh, Patricia mentioned about the data that's historic data, but h what time span are you looking at in that uh, case? And does that really matter for the parties that are involved? Because in some cases, uh, may maybe that historical data would matter, but uh, what, what if your smartphone tracks you walking around Hong Kong and knows about your you know, historical uh, walking around the city? That, that's also historical data, but is that really important 
for uh, someone who is trying to sell you what you want to eat for your next lunch. You know, you have to take all that things into consideration. I, I think that's one thing that we should be very careful about. And w another thing that I want to add in uh, relation to um, uh, whether uh, the data is bar barriers is that um, th this also relates to uh, whether data is replicable. But uh, whether data is really difficult to obtain uh, for a party, uh, if we uh, define that quite uh, lax, then that would mean that, you know, that would be in direct uh, conflict with innovation to collect those data and try to come up with new use. So we, sh we should be very careful in try when we try to strike that balance on that aspect when we talk about uh, barrier to entry. That is correct. I think on the one side we have, obviously, if, if we have a large amount of non-replicable data, I think in some ways that would be a difficult sort of replacement. I mean, I think substitution there would be very difficult. But we, we should also keep in mind that I think when we have data in most instances, these are things that are floating around there. I mean, it's always been around, right? And I think people have always been using data. Uh, and if we look at, you know, even in the olden period where there was no sort of less sort of internet access. I mean, if we used credit card, you know, in some other nation, we would get a call from the uh, credit company asking us whether our you know, credit card was stolen. And even that they were using data to some extent to sort of identify a person who is a resident of Korea if he uses a, you know, credit card somewhere in, you know, U.S. or something, they, they might sort of look into it. Now, obviously, the data has, you know, allowed us these companies to focus on this more effectively and more accurately, right? Uh, I, but I think to sort of see this entire data as sort of characterize it into one sort of area and say, you know, is comparable to sort of one thing that we are more used to sort of understanding, I think might lead us in on a dangerous path. Um, I just want to pick up on something that Sushi said about innovation. So uh, maybe it might help to just to level set this conversation. Even if data is an entry barrier, that doesn't mean that there is anti-competitive conduct going on, right? That's just um, understanding the competitive landscape. We still need to do more work to determine whether or not there's any there there for us to evaluate. Um, and certainly to the extent that the barrier is the result of innovation by an incumbent. Um, we certainly don't want to take action that somehow diminishes that innovation incentive. I will also sort of on a final note observe that there have been um, suggestions that even if data is a barrier to entry, innovation by uh, a, a new entrant um, could overcome that because they may be able to do more with less data either by having better algorithms, for example, um, or more accurate data. So it's not necessarily the size of the data that creates the, in, the entry barrier. It, it very, again, it depends on the situation, but there could be instances where you might think to yourself, look, in this particular market, the barriers look high, but there appear to be rivals who are developing better products and certainly could overcome what appear to be the barriers um, associated with big data. Maybe then I can move on and then talk about if, if let's say, in the event that data is a type of barrier um, and regular regulators have started thinking about, you know, what can we do to address um, that issue? And so, for example, data portability has been a topic that has floated around as a potential solution. Um, are regulators in, let's say, maybe we can hear about from Japan, what do they think about data portability and what is the discussion there? Actually, that's one of the uh, key topics that's in discussion right now, uh, uh, whether data portability should be introduced and if yes, uh, to what extent. Uh, we have yet to see uh, what the regulator is thinking. Um, the context that this is discussed is whether you know, ha having data portability might allow uh, competitors that want access to that data would have a better chance to compete 
uh, that is one argument that is made from the side that are, are arguing for introducing data portability. But uh, again, um, this is still work in progress, and I, I haven't uh, any information which way it's going. So it, it's still a uh, flux in Japan right now, so I can't f provide further comments here. Maybe in the other jurisdictions, what are people thinking about when they think about solutions? I think Korea's about at the same stage as Japan in some sense, right? The, and it, this is largely being dealt with by the data protection authorities in Korea. And there's about five, I think, different agencies that are involved in data protection other than KFTC, because obviously KFTC is not directly concerned with, that, with data protection. You know, they have the Personal Data Protection Agency, Ministry of Interior, Financial Supervisory Service, <laughs> uh, Ministry of Communication, um, and one other ministry which I can sort of remember at this point. Uh, all these industry uh, agencies that are involved in data protection, uh, like my good colleague Youngjin stated in the morning, uh, Korea's data protection law is more stringent than the European privacy law uh, in some many aspects. But the, K the Korean law has not yet gone to the extent of the data portability. Uh, and these agencies are discussing the issue. Uh, and it is a, a area of active discussion. But I am not aware of the sort of the latest sort of direction in which the Korea will take with respect to data portability. Patricia, do you have anything to add, I think, from the US side? Or, I mean, if regulators are, it's a wait and see, are there other are jurisdictions that people are taking a lead on that um, regulators are now watching? So I always have to say that I have a knee-jerk reaction because I call myself an enforcer, not a regulator. <laughs> um, <laughs> noted, noted. <laughs> so. And what that means to me is that I am looking for um, violations of our antitrust laws, and I do not, uh, within my mandate, have um, responsibilities for identifying whether or not regulation would be appropriate uh, in any particular circumstance. I will say that the idea of data is an entry barrier is obviously something that we have to consider in, in any of our cases. Um, whether data is the product or a particular, particularly relevant input, right? We need to understand the extent to which barriers exist, and we need to prove those barriers if we're going to bring an action. Um, I guess what I would like to say about data portability is one of the things that you know we would be, from an antitrust perspective, concerned about is the extent to which companies who collect data, say, about their own products, are forced to share it. That's obviously something that we frown upon. Um, when it comes to third-party data, maybe there's a, a different story there versus first-party data because third-party data is being collected about somebody else. Um, and potentially, um, that's not... The, the data, the raw data itself may not be proprietary and therefore wouldn't necessarily be thought to facilitate collusion. Um, but I think we just have to think very carefully about what data uh, would be um, within the scope of any of these types of regulations because, again, there are different types of data used for different purposes. Um, if we're talking specifically about consumer data, obviously um, there are also concerns from the privacy perspective. And so forced sharing, for example, might raise concerns from the privacy perspective and we have our own Bureau of Consumer Protection within our agency. Um, who would want to weigh in on uh, any regulatory proposals like that. Um, other than that, the only thing I would say with respect to data portability, I, I do know that there are jurisdictions that are thinking about that as a solution um, to the, the concerns about entry barriers. And I imagine that with experience, we'll learn more from you know, how, uh, what they're learning from the implementation of those regulations, and we'd be interested in, in um, hearing from them about um, how that works. We have within the Federal Trade Commission a policy, um, two policy groups, frankly. They had recently conducted a number of hearings. Uh, some of them are, were focused, focused on, um, you know, tech issues, 
and I think that they are very interested in understanding the developments around data portability and how it might relate to our antitrust enforcement. Maybe one one more question, and I think John and Atsushi, this one, I'm going to direct it at both of you. Um, what, what do you think about proposals that are data portability beyond um, national scope, do, international, regional? I, I, I think it, initially it should be regional. Uh, the reason why I say this is uh, John mentioned that in Korea, uh, the regulators are very serious about protecting data privacy. Uh, whereas in Japan, um, actually data privacy is not considered, not yet considered as a fundamental right. And how the data privacy regime works in Japan is uh, the regulation imposes uh, obligations on entities that handle uh, data collected from uh, individuals. And through that mechanism, try to protect personal data. So already, you have a very different way of addressing uh, protection of uh, personal data. So uh, at the initial stage, I, I think it should be um, uh, regional. However, w when we think about um, data portability as moving around data, uh, in this uh, global economy, it doesn't mean that that movement will stay uh, within one uh, jurisdiction. So at the same time, we have to think how we are going to address that movement. And at that stage, it would be, it surely would be international. I, I agree with that, Sushi. And I think to add on, I think there's a, obviously because of different level of pro, sort of the regulation or the protection granted in the European system, the Korean system, Japan system, US system, to make it global would be a real problem. But I, I think on the other hand, the real problem is that these laws will necessarily probably reach outside of its own jurisdiction. The Europeans have gone and said that if, if you do anything in Europe and collect information from the Europeans, then you're subject to their privacy act. Uh, Koreans would do the same, and I think the Japanese and so forth, uh, the Americans. Uh, then I think the real concern, at, there's a realistic sort of obstacle to enforcement of this law in various jurisdictions, right? If you have a enforcement of the Korean law across the globe, but because obviously because of the age of the technology and the internet development, many of these informations are now being collected by companies that are not within each, each jurisdiction. So necessarily these will impact the, these companies on a sort of global scale. So one thing I wanted to mention that even if the um, FTC is not um, part of the conversation with respect to data portability, I mean, we do have in the context of remedies um, opportunities to require the licensing of data if we think that that's necessary to support the, um, the buyer of divestiture assets, their competitive viability going forward. And so um, even in the core logic case, in that settlement, we required the licensing not only of the historical data, but we actually required the merged parties to license future data that they collected for several years in order to make sure the new uh, competitor was viable. So we're certainly willing uh, in certain cases to require that data be offered to a rival to allow that rival to replicate any lost competition. And so I just want to note that, you know, obviously in the specific circumstances where appropriate, um, we do require that data to be made available to rivals. So I want to follow up with uh, Atsushi's uh, comment on the portability, portability um, idea that, you know, if you give the consumers a way to you know, basically own their data, right? Uh, and then they decide who they give it to, who they sell it to, or something like that. Um, I, I wonder if if you have, you know, or, you know the public policy the domain have thought about what implications that will have about current businesses. Because, you know, right now, there are a lot of loyalty programs, things like that, you know, giving a lot of perks to the consumers. In exchange, we're basically giving data to them. 
right? Every time we have a loyalty card, we swipe it, we give away our data. But in exchange, we get rewards from those programs, right? So it is a way that we are selling the data to the, to the companies. And uh, I mean, to some extent, you know, maybe some people realize it, some people don't. Uh, but once you change, once you have regulation, change that model, you know, loyalty programs may no longer exist, you know, a lot of things may change. I, I wonder if you know, some consideration has given to that. The short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think that's, that's a very interesting point. Um, two things that came to mind. Um, you said that consumers uh, may be giving their data away. Uh, one thing that came to mind is w whether is that exclusive or not. And I would think that it's not exclusive. but. That, that might change in the future, but you never know. The other thing that came across to my mind is, actually, during the discussions uh, whether or not to introduce data for literally, there have been, there have been uh, some surveys uh, to learn about consumer behavior and what they were actually thinking or what they think of their data uh, being provided. Are you aware of that data being used by other parties, or do you think that it's worth some sort of monetary value or not? So I, I think that's an issue that has come up. But going back to my initial response, I don't know what they are thinking right now. But that is certainly on the table for them to consider. Thank you for the, uh, for the sharing. I, I, my question is actually linked to the first questions about the data port portabilities and uh, data sharing between entities. Um, can you actually talk something talk something about uh, facial recognition uh, technologies? Because um, when it comes to facial recognition data and the data that they amass from the publics, um, if companies actually are uh, entering into mergers, um, what are the potential concerns that actually can trigger uh, investigations from from the commissioners? And and uh, when when you talk about the entrance, new entries, new entrants uh, into the market, does that new entries? entities actually include government agencies? Because there are some instances where Amazon is actually, uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but Amazon is actually trying to sell uh, facial recognition software on, and algor algorithms to government agencies. And how, how, what kind of pro privacy issues does that actually come up? Um, can, you, can you guys actually touch, about, touch, touch something about it in, a, in the Japanese market and Korean market? And the reason is this. I, I think the, the issue with respect to privacy is an important issue. And I think Korea does take it seriously. And like, like I said, there's five agencies or ministries that are involved in protecting data. And I think it's, they, they should sort of take the lead on you know, protecting the you know, individual data and the privacy there. I think the KFTC is an expert in protecting competition. right? So unless there is an antitrust harm from the selling of these programs, uh, the KFTC should really try to refrain from intervening on the basis that there is a infringement on the privacy. Because I think the inf infringement on the privacy should really be dealt with by the agency that is, you know, the, the basically specialized in that. In Korea, there is the, you know, the PDIs, Personal Data and Information Protection Agency, that actually you know sort of deals with this issue. But I think from the antitrust perspective, unless there's an antitrust harm, uh, and I uh, maybe if we think about it long enough, we can probably come up with some might be able to come up with some plausible theory of antitrust harm. Uh, but I, I can't think of one at this point. Uh, just briefly comment. Um, I, I'm not aware of uh, that kind of thing happening in Japan. Uh, facial recognition uh, is not on the priority. Maybe Japan has been left so behind uh, from other countries in terms of technologies. Um, the other thing, whether government uh, institutions or entities could be considered as new entries. Um, yeah, technically, yes. But again, in, in Japan, uh, government entities uh, tend to be the later to introduce these type of uh, technologies. And I doubt that Amazon made that sale in Japan. So uh, it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say, but we're not there yet in Japan right now. 
I'm just curious, a bit off topic, but still about big data. I want to uh, ask whether you know, any antitrust authorities ever thought about using big data uh, in the you know, detection and investigation of uh, antitrust violations. So actually, that's a very relevant question. Um, in um, our general efforts at the FTC to you know, coordinate um, our understanding of you know, advances in technology and how to do antitrust enforcement in these areas, we've been talking to a lot of different foreign jurisdictions um, to understand their thinking about digital markets. And one of the things that has come up is the extent to which um, at least uh, one other jurisdiction is thinking about trying to enhance its uh, data analysis internally to help them do their review of uh, potentially anti-competitive behavior. It's probably more in the merger context, um, but I find that fascinating. And so it's not a current effort um, within the Federal Trade Commission, although I'm, I'm I have been keeping tabs on what this other jurisdiction is doing in that respect. Obviously, technology is expensive, uh, and um, we do have our own already internal reviews for like document analysis, et, et cetera. We do have our own economic modeling and, and programs to analyze data for the empirical approaches. Um, but specifically trying to advance our use of these sorts of technologies, specifically algorithms, um, is something that is new to me, and, it's, and I think it's worth considering. Okay, I think that's that's it. For, oh, okay. I think we have time. One one last one for big data. Um, so I come from the field of information systems, and one of the things that we think about a lot is about sort of the impact of the cumulative impact of data. So you know A, you know B, but then knowing A and B together can be a lot more severe in terms of privacy and so on. And so I was wondering if uh, and 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 those can lead to a lot of unintended consequences. So from a regulatory perspective, I mean, do you how do you kind of, I guess, not exhaustively, but how do you think about sort of what are all the potential unintended consequences? Is there, is there a mechanism that you follow or you just see what goes wrong? Uh, so I'm not sure if you're asking like if there's a screening mechanism that we use to identify when there are potential problems. I will say with respect to our case generation, um, we will... Uh, obviously evaluate complaints that come in about specific conduct or mergers. Um, we also have our reportable merger program. So oftentimes, you know, we're evaluating the cases that are brought to us to determine whether or not there are any particular competitive concerns. And the extent to which data is relevant to that analysis will be very fact specific. Um, as part of the startup of this task force, we actually have been engaged in a general market outreach to understand um, whether or not we should be focused on specific um, technologies as uh, mechanisms for uh, raising concerns. Obviously, AI is one of the um, technologies that is at the forefront there. But otherwise, we, we don't have a screening mechanism for when the aggregation of different data sets might raise competitive concerns. We're, we're looking at specific allegations of conduct or specific mergers um, to determine whether or not there are potential anti-competitive issues, and data may or may not be relevant to that analysis. Okay, so I think actually that leads quite uh, nicely into the next topic, which is AI. Um, and when we talk about artificial intelligence, I think it's such a broad subject, and we perhaps can start at the one side of the spectrum, which is algorithms. And we can focus our discussions on algorithms today. Um, and by algorithms, I'm thinking about um, a coded set of um, instructions, whereby then the algorithm goes on to, to perform um, the coded function. And so in that context, what aspects of algorithms can give rise to antitrust concerns? So we're starting from basics. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, I'll throw out some ideas. Um, obviously, there have been concerns raised about algorithms as a mechanism for collusion. And um, you heard our keynote speaker mention a case um, not where the algorithm itself was the problem, but the agreement between humans and the facilitating mechanism was um, agreeing to use an algorithm to uh, allow them to reach a coordinated pricing outcome. 
Um, so the question of whether algorithms facilitate collusion is one. The second that I've heard of, and I find it very interesting, is the use of algorithms perhaps to detect nascent competitors in a marketplace. And that is just fascinating because this goes to the gentleman's question about whether the agencies are using um, advanced uh, data analysis, analyses um, because with respect to nascent acquisition or acquisitions of nascent competitors, there's a problem with identifying whether or not the acquisition raises potentially competitive concerns. And if companies are using algorithms to help them do that, um, we're not going to know about that. We're not going to know what acquisitions raise competitive concerns um, unless somebody brings it to our attention. So that, that's part of the reason why I'm so fascinated with your, your question about the uh, data analysis we might be using. Um, I don't know that even if a company is doing this, again, that there's anything that we can do. We don't have a screening mechanism that would allow us to detect it. We're really relying on either a pattern of conduct that brings us to our attention or somebody complaining about it, whether it's a rival or even internal to the company like a whistleblower. Okay, so maybe I can pose a hypothetical question, which is, let's say um, there are algorithms that in the absence of other human um, evidence or internal document evidence and the algorithm, what ends up happening is a pricing algorithm that aligns the, uh, the prices and the outcomes of two competitors. Um, in terms of an analysis perspective, is, is that enough to constitute a problem under antitrust laws? And I think from the Korean perspective it would not, right? Because I think the simple parallel pricing itself at least under the current standard, it's not a you know, violation of Korean antitrust law. Now, I, I think um, obviously if we go, to, if, if there's, like in some of the cases, there was an agreement to use the same algorithm uh, so that they would come to a same price, that would be a problem. But that's, that would be a problem in any other circumstances if they agreed to sort of co you know, coordinate by mail instead of you know, software, that's that same thing. Uh, I, I think we, we may go into a more difficult area if people n both know that they're using the same algorithm, right? Uh, you know, knowingly or un unknowingly, or somehow the information about algorithm that one is using to set prices somehow uh, shared with some of its competitors. I think that might, you know, raise, you know, trigger additional issues, right? Uh, and I think even then, whether because of the current state in Korean law as to whether the information exchange itself constitutes cartel or there has to be something more than simple information exchange. Uh, I think, at least in Korea, that would be in the gray area. Obviously, I, I, I would tell clients not to do it because, <laughs> <laughs> right? because I, I think we don't want to be in the gray area with respect to collusion in Korea, but yeah. I think if we simply, there, because people use different algorithms that self-learn and that happen to generate similar sort of parallel price, I don't think would be a problem in Korea. Japan basically, uh, I think it's the same under the current regime. Um, for collusion, uh, under the current uh, law, you, you don't need a strictly agreement, but you need some sort of a meeting of intention or communication of intention. And so long as the agency or the court could not find uh, that kind of communication or uh, meeting of the intentions happening, then it's not uh, uh, illegal under the current regime. But you have to be careful because you never know how uh, agreement will be uh, found based on circumstantial evidence. So as John said, uh, I, I would definitely tell the client to be careful not to do that, even under the current regime. So one thing I guess I would add, obviously we need an agreement in the U.S. Um, in part, we don't want to condemn unilateral pricing because at what point, you know, do we tell someone that what you're doing is illegal under the law? So unilateral pricing, you know, if two companies simply happen to end up using the same algorithm, I, I don't see that raising an antitrust issue. Uh, but will I, what I will add to what has already been said is, you know, so interdependent or parallel pricing is not illegal in the U.S. without the agreement. Um, and so what we try to do, of course, is prevent 
increases in concentration through our merger law. That's, um, that's where we can prevent this oligopolistic pricing outcomes. Um, and so that's particularly, that's why merger uh, regimes are particularly important, I think, because of the, the gap with respect to interdependent pricing. Are there um, cases um, that I think in each of your jurisdictions that actually already discuss and then analyze algorithms? So our prior speaker did mention the U.S. case, which I think is officially called U.S. v. Topkins, um, where there was an agreement to use a pricing algorithm to reach uh, coordinated prices in the Department of Justice condemn that. But um, as John said, you know, any agreement <laughs> to fix prices is illegal. Uh, so while algorithms were the mechanism through which they um, were able to reach prices, and, and by the way, once they uh, agreed on the algorithm and set it up, um, it was self-executing, which is particularly problematic because, you know, if they were to have destroyed all the documents of their agreement, it would have been very hard for us to, or for them to detect. Um, but the idea there was there was an agreement between people. It wasn't just the algorithm alone. I'm, I'm not aware of a sort of algorithm-driven <coughs> cartel case in Korea. <coughs> I, I think, in, I mean, the, obviously the communications have become more sophisticated. They, you know, they, they, they don't have like the meeting minutes of their sort of cartel agreements and so forth anymore. But, I mean, uh, people communicate via chess and so forth, but I, I don't think I've seen a sort of algorithm-driven, sort of algorithm-executed cartel in Korea. And, and it's the same in Japan, not, not that I'm, I'm aware of. Let me just add one more thing. Um, there is a lot of concern about algorithms, but it's a, a lot of it is theoretical. Uh, and so it, it could be, you know, that it's occurring and we don't know it, or it could be that the technology is not sufficiently advanced enough for there to be um, the, the coordinated pricing outcome without the human agreement in advance. So it, it doesn't seem that there is necessarily a lot of basis for the concern about it. It's more on a theoretical level at this point. It, that doesn't mean it couldn't change over time as uh, there is a greater use and refinement of algorithms. And suppose, I guess then, if, if detection or based on enforcement, there hasn't been an, an, a lot of uh, enforcement in this area. Do you think it's because actually the antitrust detection tools or analysis tools are not there yet in the regulators? <laughs> They're not using the word regulator. Oh, uh, enforcers, <laughs> enforcers. Um, I, I would say, I mean, you might have the same problem you would with any cartel. Um, the, the question is, uh, that it can happen and, and go undetected, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem with um, the antitrust uh, rules as they're set up. Okay. Um, and then I think for the practitioners then, um, both of you had mentioned about if you were advising a client, you would advise them not to. <laughs> Maybe we can ask the both of you, um, when you do, advise a client on designing algorithms or um, practices around algorithms. What kind of practical advice have you given that you think clients can actually take away and implement? I, I think the advice is basically consistent with the traditional advice we give in with, with, with respect to sort of collusion and cartel in Korea. You know, do not share information with competitors, right? Uh, I mean, same thing with algorithms. Do not share algorithm information, software, their plans, targets, uh, the method. Uh, I think it's just to exercise great caution uh, in not only sh not sharing information, but also avoiding the appearance of any coordination, right? Uh, I, I think, uh, and. Uh, avoid drawing unnecessary attention to that client. And I think this is the same whether it deals with algorithm or it deals with any other sort of just business conduct by the clients. At the end of the day, what matters, at least now, what matters is whether there's some sort of communication between human beings. So the basic message would be the same. But at the same time, 
since、uh, this topic has、uh, been discussed quite frequently these days, I think it's also important to advise the client that they should be aware that this is an area that the regulators are starting to、uh, look into or you know, look for any leads. So maybe the client not, might not be aware that they should be careful when they you know,、uh, ask their vendors to make some sort of algorithm, and that might end up in an antitrust case. So、uh, raising that kind of awareness would be something that would be added、uh, to the advice. But Uh, again,、uh, the basic message would be the same. Be careful when you communicate with computers. I have one question, but、uh, before the question, and, and you know, I, I like to add one comment about the, you know, the automatic cartel by an AI machine. And、uh, maybe you know, the, if you know, Terminator will appear, then that kind of happen. But you know, the, now that the, you know, the current technique, you know, AI can learn、uh, you know, by deeply and deeply. Just, just that. So, and also, you know, in Japan, and we, JFTC, conducted market survey about, you know, what, uh, how, uh, what percent of the retailer using an automatic repricing tool? Just,、uh, you know, several percent, you know, six point or seven percent, that, like that. So, most of the, you know, retailer don't use the automatic repricing tool. So that's why the, you know, it's a very limited area. Maybe you know, the,、uh, you know, airplane ticket or something like that、uh, may be a subject of the, you know, that kind of cartel, but、uh, still you know, we need some, some kind of agreement.、Uh, if you know, that the you know, company tries to utilize that, the, you know,、uh, AI to communicate with each other, so there must be、uh, some kind of agreement I'm a, I'm a, by a you know, ticket、uh, seller. So that's why that,、uh, you know, that we should be very cautious about the, you know, that we, we, got, we, we will have、uh, some kind of suspicion about that kind of AI cartel. So, but、uh, it's, it's not my question. You know, I'd like to move on to the question, my question. You know, the,、uh, Patricia made a comment about、uh, you, know, uh, you, made, uh, you are now, you know, FTC, US FTC is now considering about the, you know, utilizing、uh, Sherman Article 2.、Uh, Article 2 For uh, uh, analyzing a startup、uh, acquisition of a startup. I think that it's a very good, good idea because you, know, the,、uh, you mentioned that the, you know, the,、uh, utilizing a l g o r i t h m and for a data, big data, it's a kind of you know, entrenching、uh, you know, big data uh, platform. Uh, so I think that you know, sometimes you know, if you buy up that,、uh, one company which has a big data and one company, a startup company which has a big Uh, you know, good algorithm. So, if you buy up the, the, those kind of series of the acquisition, you can make a big entrench for you know, the protecting the, their core business or something like that. So, that's why utilizing、uh, you know, Sharma、uh, Article 2 is a very good idea. But my question is that,、uh, you know, that both, you know, each individual merger will be passed in your heart of Scott or you know, uh, uh, your merger process. So, maybe each startup company acquisition will be passed in your review. So, you, you made a approval, legal certainty for each acquisition. So, after that, you started、uh, investigation by Ashama、uh, Article 2. So, it's, not, it's opposing to a, a legal certainty、uh, for the start, acquisition of startup company. So, I think that the,、uh, for the legal practitioner, It's not good for getting a legal certainty to pass your approval of the review,、uh, merger review. So I think that you know, it's kind of you know, contradiction between the legal certainty and also、uh, you know, that maybe you should, our enforcer should get into a, a more and more uh, you know, tr- uh, no, 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 a fair and fair、uh, competition. So that's why I have to, So how to. Overcome this kind of contradiction. But anyway, I really feel empathy, empathy、uh, feel sympathy with your idea. So,、uh, but anyway,、uh, that's my question. Thank you. So, it's a very good question. And I will say one of the reasons, well, let me make,、um, let me give you a little bit of background first. The task force、um, is not、uh, going to review、uh, Hart Scott Rodino. Uh, reportable mergers. So those will stay within our merger divisions. What we're thinking will most likely fall to the technology task force are consummated mergers.、Um, and they could have been reported. This is your question about legal certainty. They could have been reported and reviewed.、Um, but the task force will also look at non reportable mergers. 
Um, I think the view is, and, and this is subject to further uh, research and confirmation, the view is a lot of these acquisitions of potential nascent rivals are going to fall below the reporting threshold, and so they, ne they wouldn't necessarily have been reviewed by the agencies. So this does not raise the concerns that you're articulating because there would have been no review of those transactions. And the idea would be if there's some reason to think that a, a dominant firm is using these kinds of acquisitions that are below the reporting threshold of companies they perceive as potential rivals, that we want to look at it as potentially exclusionary conduct. Now, um, it is the case in the U.S. that it could be the deal was reportable and that it was reviewed and that we later find out that they're, um, as a result of the transaction, they were able to raise prices. And we do have the ability to go back and look at those consummated mergers and challenge them. So your question about certainty is well taken. We have not done that very often. And you usually only do that when there are significant um, allegations of price increases that bring it back to our attention that perhaps there was something in our initial review we missed. Obviously, just because we missed it doesn't mean they should be able to get away with something illegal. And that's why we will go back and look at it later. But that does not happen very often. So I don't know that we violate your concerns yeah. about legal uh, certainty. So, so my question is related to your part of question. So, so far, I mean, the discussion seems to be uh, assuming the situation where algorithms are developed uh, in-house, okay? And somehow, I mean, they figure out how to, how to collude. But as a hypothetical situation, so suppose that there is a, an independent uh, firm specializing uh, making algorithm. Let's say, I mean, the, this firm is, let's say, go to uh, Delta Airlines and was able to sell uh, its algorithm. And once they sell to Delta, then they also approach to, let's say, United Air. Okay. And when they promote their, their product, actually, the best signal might be they were able to sell to high-profile companies. So they may advertise, well, our algorithm is so good, and we, were, we, we sold to, to Delta. So then maybe uh, United Airlines also uh, buy the same algorithm. And also, algorithm is a software, so it can be regularly updated. And now the company actually update the software and then um, make them collude. So in such a case, then uh, what would happen? Who, who is liable? I mean, is, is, it, is it Delta and the United are liable or the software company is liable? I mean, that's how, how they do it. Um, so I have to just say I want to be very careful about trying to address these hypotheticals. <laughs> um, <laughs> because every hypothetical um, you could posit very different facts and come out with a very different outcome. Um, so obviously we're not ta talking about any real cases here. Uh, um, um, but the idea again is, uh, well, so first of all, to set your hypothetical up, um, there are lots of companies who provide software to help um, companies within a market um, uh, conduct pricing. So there are a lot of software and algorithm tools that are available that people can buy off the shelf um, to help them uh, determine how to price. That happens in the retail gas industry. I'm sure it happens in a lot of different industries. So this isn't, um, it, this isn't like a far-fetched example. This is, I mean, a lot of businesses buy um, this kind of software. Uh, your question is about who is liable. So you could have somebody who is facilitating um, coordinated pricing between the customers who are buying that software. It's, it's, it's feasible, but you would have to have evidence that that was what was happening, that somebody is, again, coordinating the outcome of their behavior in an effort to fix prices. What, what, what we're currently saying um, up here right now, given our current state of knowledge, is that absent some sort of human intervention, it's hard for us to see how this would violate the laws as they currently exist. I, I, I recall reading a case sometime earlier, and I can't recall exactly. I think it dealt with a hotel reservations or something where there was a one sort of spoke that sold sort of that sort of coordinated prices. But I think um, even there, I, I think the the decision did require some sort of a you know, knowledge on the part of participants with respect to that price coordination to constitute a 
law violation there. So I think if there's a, there is no coordination on price uh, by humans, I think it's difficult. But I think, I think if there's a coordination there, I think it would be a sort of liability to lie there. So I'll just add to this, the point about the human um, intervention. So there was a Department of Justice case where airlines had agreed to use the same computerized system. Uh, and the idea was it was, I think, for online booking. It was an interface for customers to book their tickets. But they were using that computerized system to coordinate their pricing. So. I, I don't know enough about the facts of that case to, to understand how it came to be, that that's the way they ended up using the system. But, but they were using that system to set their prices. And that's where the concern arises. Okay, so we're, we're out of town. I... One more? Okay, one more. <laughs> one more. Just following my fellow economists, <coughs> regarding these uh, two machines, uh, black box type of uh, collusion, um, I recall that recently in EU we have, we may have a sp explicit policy. Uh, Madam Vestager said in one vacation, vacation that she said it is the companies that use the machine are, that are reliable, liable for the uh, for the uh, for what the machines are, do, are doing. So that's what uh, if I. I'm not mistaken. So the EU seems to have taken uh, a position, explicit position, that type of collusion, not the other two types, you know, uh, hub and spoke or taxi collusion. Uh, the black box, two, two uh, machines uh, learning from each other. Um, the companies that use the machine are liable. That's what she said, if I recall correctly. Oh, judging by the number of questions, these are hot topics. So <laughs> at this juncture, I want to thank um, the three universities for hosting this panel. It's been fantastic in this conference. And then to my panelists, thank you very much for participating and answering these tough, tough questions. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>